Hello, and welcome to The Bard's Truth with your host, The Green Bard. This is The Dire Wolves of Winterfell, episode 4.7, A Storm of Swords, Summer, and the Winged Wolf, Unchained. In the third volume, now that Bran is unchained and has accepted his nature as a warg, we see him develop his skills with the help of Jojen. He becomes so adept in Summer's skin that he is able to save Jon's life. This shows his progress as a warg while serving to remind us of his empathy and his pack bond to Jon. In a darker turn, we also see him use this power over Hodor. It's in a good cause to save them from the wildlings, but it's still ominous. The development of these powers is unique to Bran among his siblings. No one else can control humans. Still, our other themes continue. Summer continues to show his independence while being fiercely protective of Bran. Toward the end of the volume, Summer is twice separated from Bran, resulting in near misses, reminding us of the theme of bad things happening when the wolves are separated from the children. Parallel to the final reminder for Grey Wind and Rob, also in this volume, unfortunately. Pack remains important, though. We get some direct wolf thoughts about the bond to the other dire wolves from Summer that he periodically senses his siblings. This will be contrasted to similar thoughts we get in A Dance with Dragon from Ghost. A Storm of Swords, Bran 1. We start with the wolf dream. Notice that the language of the first paragraph seems to be more boy thoughts than wolf thoughts, with a mention of specific tree species, while the thoughts become more and more wolfish as the dream continues. As Summer begins to exert his own thoughts, Bran still puts in his own ideas, though. These deliberate warging adventures are much more a mind meld than when Bran was mostly riding alongside Summer in earlier wolf dreams. Note also that Summer climbs a hill, just as Ghost did in the same volume. Are they trying to contact each other? Is it easier to sense or be sensed from Hilltop? Count this as pack behavior, for sure. Once Summer begins to think of his own sibling wolves, though, Bran is relegated to passenger. I glean much from these thoughts but we don't get any detail beyond him knowing that Lady is dead and Shaggy is close, but getting further and further away as time passes. He knows they are hunting, but we get no detail at all about Nymeria, Ghost, and Grey Wind. Recall from my intro to Nymeria's story that I believe Shaggy and Ghost to be stronger in the magic than the other wolves, so it makes sense that Shaggy would be the easiest to sense, though this passage isn't strong proof of that idea, given that he is also the closest in physical proximity. Ghost, of course, is seemingly incommunicado because he's beyond the wall. The ridge slanted sharply from the earth, a long fold of stone and soil shaped like a claw. Trees clung to its lower slopes, pines and hawthorn and ash. But higher up, the ground was bare, the ridge line stark against the cloudy sky. He could feel the high stone calling him. Up he went, loping easy at first, then faster and higher, his strong legs eating up the incline. Birds burst from the branches overhead as he raced by, clawing and flapping their way into the sky. He could hear the wind sighing amongst the leaves, the squirrels chittering to one another, even the sound a pine cone made as it tumbled to the forest floor. The smells were a song around him, a song that filled the good green world. Gravel flew from beneath his paws as he gained the last few feet to stand upon the crest. The sun hung above the tall pines, huge and red, and below him the trees and hills went on and on, as far as he could see or smell. A kite was circling far above, dark against the pink sky. Prince, the man sound came into his head suddenly, yet he could feel the rightness of it. Prince of the green, prince of the wolf's wood. He was strong and swift and fierce, and all that lived in the good green world went in fear of him. Far below, at the base of the woods, something moved amongst the trees. A flash of gray, quick glimpsed and gone again, but it was enough to make his ears prick up. Down there beside a swift green brook, another form slipped by, running. Wolves, he knew, his little cousins, chasing down some prey. Now the prince could see more of them, shadows on fleet gray paws, a pack. He had a pack as well once. Five they had been, and a sixth who stood aside. Somewhere down inside him were the sounds the men had given them to tell one from the other. But it was not by their sounds he knew them. He remembered their scents, his brothers and sisters. They all had smelled alike, had smelled of pack, but each was different, too. His angry brother with the hot green eyes was near, the prince felt, though he had not seen him for many hunts. Yet with every sun that set he grew more distant, and he had been the last. The others were far scattered, like leaves blown by the wild wind. Sometimes he could sense them, though, as if they were still with him, 
only hidden from his sight by a boulder or a stand of trees. He could not smell them, nor hear their howls by night, yet he felt their presence at his back, all but the sister they had lost. His tail drooped when he remembered her. Four now, not five. Four, and one more, the white who had no voice. These woods belonged to them, the snowy slopes and stony hills, the great green pines and golden leaf oaks, the rushing streams and blue lakes fringed with fingers of white frost. But his sister had left the wilds to walk in the halls of Man Rock where the other hunters ruled, and once within those halls it was hard to find the path back out. The wolf prince remembered. The final paragraph of this remembrance is awkward. It seems that Summer is remembering Lady, or is it Nymeria? But I almost get the feeling that Bran is trying to assert his own thoughts at the same time, making the paragraph a bit hard to follow possibly intentionally incoherent by our author, trying to portray the dissimilar thoughts together, like trying to fit together pieces from two different puzzles. I definitely believe that the final line, the wolf prince remembered, is a brand thought. The next part of the chapter shows Summer in complete control. With his pack scattered, he instead runs down his cousin's pack and their prey. The instinct to hunt pulls strongly on our direwolves. Compare this scene to the time Summer and Grey Wind were not around to protect the boys from Stiff during the much earlier hunt. This is a weakness in the dire wolves' roles as protectors. Once Summer finds the wolves, Bran seems to get in a quick thought about the lack of fear in the opponent, but then Summer seems to take over again in the fight. Note that Summer easily kills the one wolf. The savage act reminds us of how merciless these wolves are in battle. Deer and fear and blood. The scent of prey woke the hunger in him. The prince sniffed the air again, turning, and then he was off, bounding along the ridge top with jaws half parted. The far side of the ridge was steeper than the one he'd come up, but he flew surefoot over stones and roots and rotting leaves, down the slope through the trees, long strides eating up the ground. The scent pulled him onward, ever faster. The deer was down and dying when he reached her, ringed by eight of his small cousins. The heads of the pack had begun to feed, the male first and then his female taking turns tearing flesh from the red underbelly of their prey. The others waited patiently, all but the tail, who paced in a wary circle a few strides from the rest, his own tail tucked low. He would eat the last of all, whatever his brothers left him. The prince was downwind, so they did not sense him until he leapt up upon a fallen log six strides from where they fed. The tail saw him first, gave a piteous whine, and slunk away. His pack brothers turned at the sound and bared their teeth, snarling all but the head wolf and female. The dire wolf answered the snarls with a low warning growl and showed them his own teeth. He was bigger than his cousins, twice the size of the scrawny tail, half again as large as the two pack heads. He leapt down into their midst, and three of them broke, melting away into the brush. Another came at him, teeth snapping. He met the attack head on, caught the wolf's leg in his jaws when they met, and flung him aside, yelping and limping. And then there was only the head wolf to face the great gray male with his bloody muzzle fresh from the prey's soft belly. There was white on his muzzle as well, to mark him as an old wolf. But when his mouth opened, red slaver ran from his teeth. He has no fear, the prince thought. No more than me. It would be a good fight. They went for each other. Long they fought, rolling together over roots and stones and fallen leaves and the scattered entrails of the prey, tearing at each other with tooth and claw, breaking apart, circling round the other and bolting in to fight again. The prince was larger, and much stronger, but his cousin had a pack. The female prowled around them closely, snuffing and snarling, and would interpose herself whenever her mate broke off bloodied. From time to time the other wolves would dart in as well, to snap at a leg or an ear when the prince was turned the other way. One angered him so much that he whirled in a black fury and tore out the attacker's throat. After that the others kept their distance. And as the last red light was filtering through green boughs and golden, the old wolf lay down weary in the dirt and rolled over to expose his throat and belly. It was submission. Later in the chapter. The prince sniffed at him and licked the blood from fur and torn flesh. When the old wolf gave a soft whimper, the dire wolf turned away. He was very hungry now, and the prey was his. At this point, Jojen begins to try to wake Bran. Summer and Bran both are annoyed. Jojen says Bran has been in the wolf too long and he painstakingly talks about how Bran can't sustain himself by eating in the wolf. The feeling of hunger in the boy's body, while mirroring the wolf's sated appetite, must be a bit confusing for Bran. But I kind of agree with Bran that Jojen is being stupid. Depriving Bran of the satisfaction of eating after the hunt seems unnecessarily mean. It would have annoyed me too. One would think Bran, 
once back in his body, would feel hunger and choose to eat naturally. However, as we discussed at the end of the prior volume, Bran wouldn't feel his appetite properly as a boy after the wolf fed. But I don't think Jojen would know this anyway. I suppose Bran could be losing weight because of this issue. So maybe Jojen's not quite as stupid as I said earlier. Illustrating my point, Bran, after waking, can still taste the deer. That's mirroring, sharing senses through the bond. John has similar experiences later in the saga. You, Prof Cecily, a friend of mine from Reddit, suggested to me that they ask Bran about marking the trees mainly because of nourishment, to make it easier for Mira to track down Summer's kills, teaching Bran not to forget his human needs during the warging experience. I think Jojen's lesson is about a bit more than this, though. If Mira is any kind of decent tracker, she could find the kills without Bran giving these unnatural signs. And nothing like that is mentioned in the text as well. Further, the group isn't mentioned as starving until the next chapter, when they leave the wood. That said, they do explicitly have Summer bring a rabbit back uneaten later, so hunting to feed the entire group may be part of Jojen's reasoning. But it is not the whole reason he is pushing Bran to do non-wolfish things inside Summer. My opinion is that the lesson is about teaching Bran to assert his own personality over Summer, not to be overwhelmed by the wolf's personality while working. The line, once he was a wolf, they never seemed important. Coupled with my above observations about the warging experience, tells me that Bran's thoughts are definitely overwhelmed by Summers, at least in part, early on in this training. Is Jojen concerned that Bran might lose some of his humanity, get lost in the wolf's mind, never to return to the boy's body? Perhaps, though the latter idea would be a bit extreme. The sudden sound made him stop and snarl. The wolves regarded him with green and yellow eyes, bright with the last light of day. None of them had heard it. It was a queer wind that blew only in his ears. He buried his jaws in the deer's belly and tore off a mouthful of flesh. Later that chapter. No, he thought. No, I won't. It was a boy's thought, not a wolf's. The woods were darkening all about him until only the shadows of the trees remained and the glow of his cousin's eyes. And through those and beyond those eyes, he saw a big man's grinning face and a stone vault whose walls were spotted with nitre. The rich, warm taste of blood faded on his tongue. No, don't. Don't. I want to eat. I want to. I want... Later that chapter. The woods and wolves were gone. Bran was back again, down in the damp vault of some ancient watchtower that must have been abandoned thousands of years before. It wasn't much of a tower now. Even the tumble stones were so overgrown with moss and ivy that you could hardly see them until you were right on top of them. Tumble Down Tower, Bran had named the place. It was Mira who found the way down into the vault, however. You were gone too long. Jojen Reed was thirteen, only four years older than Bran. Jojen wasn't much bigger either, no more than two inches or maybe three, but he had a solemn way of talking that made him seem older and wiser than he really was. At Winterfell, Old Nan had dubbed him Little Grandfather. Bran frowned at him. I wanted to eat. Later that chapter. I'm sick of frogs. Mira was a frog eater from the neck, so Bran couldn't really blame her for catching so many frogs, he supposed. But even so, I wanted to eat the deer. For a moment, he remembered the taste of it, the blood and the raw, rich meat, and his mouth watered. I won the fight for it. I won. Did you mark the trees? Bran flushed. Jojen was always telling him to do things when he opened his third eye and put on Summer's skin. To claw the bark of a tree, to catch a rabbit and bring it back in his jaws uneaten, to push some rocks in a line. Stupid things. I forgot, he said. Later. It was true. He meant to do the things that Jojen asked. But once he was a wolf, they never seemed important. There were always things to see and things to smell, a whole green world to hunt, and he could run. There was nothing better than running, unless it was running after prey. I was a prince, Jojen, he told the older boy. I was the prince of the woods. Bran's also still disappointed in his own body. It definitely shows in that last bit of the passage. The next exchange continues the idea that Bran needs to exert his own will while warging. He insists that Bran audibly delineate that he and Summer are separate entities. Even so, the bond seems to be extremely strong now, as Bran says, and one, directly after saying they are two individuals. And who is Summer? Jojen prompted. My dire wolf, he smiled. Prince of the Green. Bran the boy and Summer the wolf? You are two then? Two, he sighed. And one. He hated Jojen when he got stupid like this. At Winterfell, he wanted me to dream my wolf dreams. And now that I know how, he's always calling me back. Later, Bran muses that Jojen is a bit clueless about not being able to recognize Summer's howl, 
Note that Bran probably hears Summer's howls internally at this point, as Arya and Jon have similar experiences in this volume. Bran also thinks about how far Summer went, confirming two things. One, that Bran definitely is fully conscious and able to remember all of the time while in Summer, and two, that he could likely lead them to the kill if the need for meat were the sole reason for marking the trees. Before Mira could find a reply to that, they heard the sound, the distant howl of a wolf, drifting through the night. Summer? asked Jojen, listening. No, Bran knew the voice of his dire wolf. Are you certain? said the little grandfather. Certain. Summer had wandered far afield today, and would not be back till dawn. Maybe Jojen dreams green, but he can't tell a wolf from a dire wolf. He wondered why they all listened to Jojen so much. The exchange concludes with Jojen worrying specifically about Bran remaining forever in summer. This solidifies for me that these lessons from Jojen are mostly about Bran learning to exert his will more than they are about hunting specifically. I also wonder if Shaggy Dog and Rickon will have a similar issue. It might not go as well for them without someone like Jojen as a mentor. Jojen, what did you mean about a teacher? Bran asked. You're my teacher. I know I never marked the tree, but I will next time. My third eye is open like you want it, so wide open that I fear you might fall through it and live all the rest of your days as a wolf of the woods. I won't, I promise. The boy promises. Will the wolf remember? You run with Summer. You hunt with him kill with him, but you bend to his will more than him to yours. At this point, the group decides to go north to seek the three-eyed crow, partially because of Jojen's counsel and partially because Bran thinks somehow he can fix his broken body. A forlorn hope, but he will fly. A Storm of Swords, Bran too. The next chapter starts by mentioning that they are hungry now, having moved into the mountains. It then backtracks and says Summer was bringing them prey before they left the wood. This indicates that Bran had been able to assert his will to teach Summer to do that. We can conclude that Jojen's lessons worked for Bran. If we took the king's road, we wouldn't be so hungry either, he started saying then. Down in the hills, they had no lack of food. Mira was a fine huntress, and even better at taking fish from streams with her three-pronged frog spear. Bran liked to watch her, admiring her quickness, the way she sent the spear lancing down and pulled it back with silvery trout wriggling on the end of it and they had summer hunting for them as well. The dire wolf vanished most every night as the sun went down, but he was always back before dawn, most often with something in his jaws, a squirrel or a hare. But here in the mountains, the streams were smaller and more icy, and the game scarcer. Mira still hunted and fished when she could, but it was harder, and some nights even summer found no prey. Often they went to sleep with empty bellies. Later, Bran knows that the mountain folk have seen them traversing the land, because he saw them looking through Summer's eyes. This indicates that he is using Summer's eyes while not fully warging Summer, similar to how Arya used the cat's eyes as the blind girl. Summer then finds them a cave, probably while Bran is warging. Following that, we see another affectionate slash protective scene with Bran and Summer close. Though once Summer feels Bran needs no protection from the little, he feels the call of the hunt. This brings on another wolf dream. They know. Bran had seen them watching, not with his own eyes, but with Summer's sharper ones, that miss so little. They won't bother us so long as we don't try to make off with their goats or horses. Nor did they. Only once did they encounter any of the mountain people, when a sudden burst of freezing rain sent them looking for shelter. Summer found it for them, sniffing out a shallow cave behind the gray-green branches of a towering sentinel tree. But when Hodor ducked beneath the stony overhang, Bran saw the orange glow of a fire further back, and realized they were not alone. Come in and warm yourselves, a man's voice called out. There's stone enough to keep the rain off all our heads. Later that chapter. The bastards, boys, I he was dead, but now he's not. And paying good silver for wolf skins a man hears, and maybe gold for word of certain other walking dead. He looked at Bran when he said that, and at Summer stretched out beside him. As to that wall, the man went on, it's not a place that I'd be going. The old bear took the watch into the haunted woods, and all that come back was his ravens, with hardly a message between them. Dark wings, dark words, my mother used to say, but when the birds fly silent, seems to me that's even darker. He poked at the fire with his stick. It was different when there was a stark in winter fell, but the old wolf's dead and the young one's gone south to play the Game of Thrones, and all that's left to us is the ghosts. The wolves will come again, said Jojen solemnly. Later that chapter. They spent that night together, for the rain did not let up till well past dark, and only Summer seemed to want to leave the cave. When the fire had burned down to embers, Bran let him go. 
The dire wolf did not feel the damp as people did, and the night was calling him. Moonlight painted the wet woods in shades of silver and turned the gray peaks white. Owls hooted through the dark and flew silently between the pines, while pale goats moved along the mountain sides. Rain closed his eyes and gave himself up to the wolf dream, to the smells and sounds of midnight. The chapter concludes with Brain attempting and failing to skin change an eagle. One must wonder if it is Veramir's eagle, or some other eagle that's already being skin changed. Bran may have the power to do it at this point, but he fails nonetheless. Bran lifted his head and saw it, its gray wings spread and still as it floated on the wind. He followed it with his eyes as it circled higher, wondering what it would be like to soar about the world so effortless. Better than climbing, even. He tried to reach the eagle, to leave his stupid, crippled body and rise into the sky to join it, the way he joined with Summer. The green seers could do it. I should be able to do it, too. He tried and tried, until the eagle vanished in the golden haze of the afternoon. It's gone, he said, disappointed. Like I said, Bran will fly, just not quite yet. That'll do it for this episode. See you next time. Thanks to all the terrific artists who let me use their work on this YouTube video. Thanks as always to my family. this content, you can also consider supporting us on Patreon.